Thank you, Tina. Thank you for that warm welcome. And uh, thank you, all of you uh, for having me here. Uh, uh, as Tina mentioned, uh, I'm actually not from uh, New York, but I love the city of New York. I have a few friends in the audience. Um, but I wanted to call out that I feel a little bit weird coming to you today and talking to you about the concept of risk coming into New York, which <laughs> I kind of feel like if you ask anybody, like, what city would you know of uh, uh, for risk, they might say New York, you know, home of the financial capital of the world. Um, and so I feel like a bit of an outsider, like I'm in the risk capital of the world coming and talking to you uh, from, from the outside. But thank you all for having me. I'm actually from another city that is very well known for risk, uh, quite a different type of risk, uh, but that's uh, Las Vegas. So I think Las Vegas would be another city that people would say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a risky city, obviously. The gambling mecca of the world. Um, and that's actually what brought me out to Las Vegas about 10 years ago. Um, I was uh, living in Gainesville, Florida at the time, uh, teaching high school. Uh, which I loved, by the way. I was a math and computer science teacher in Gainesville, Florida. And, uh, and I loved that, but I also uh, happened to be playing online poker at the time. Um, this was uh, before the government cracked down and made that illegal, but uh, playing online poker. And I happened to be making more money playing online poker uh, than I was teaching high school. And, and, so, and I always knew that teaching high school, even though I, I loved doing it, it was kind of a short-term thing while I figured out what uh, I wanted to do. Um, and so I scratched my head and I thought, well, this poker thing is going pretty well. Um, let me see what I can do about this. So I packed up my bags, uh, headed out west to, uh, to Las Vegas to kind of fulfill my own personal manifest destiny, move west young man. Uh, and I moved out to Las Vegas and really fell in love with the city um, and also fell in love with kind of the lifestyle of playing professional poker. Um, there are a lot of freelancers in this audience, so, and I kind of feel like professional poker is a bit like freelancing, where you uh, set your own hours, where you're uh, able to kind of be your own boss, um, and I really love that. I really love the flexibility of that and the freedom of that. Um, poker, is, poker is a really interesting game. I actually grew up uh, playing cards all the time. Um, actually, I have a few friends that I used to play uh, hearts with. Uh, to many hours of the night um, uh, as I was growing up. And so I've always had a love for games, always had a love for cards. And so being a professional poker player was just very natural to me. Um, and I really loved it. Um, but it's got its ups and its downs. Uh, there's a large element of risk in poker, obviously. Um, unlike most other jobs, uh, you can actually show up on a given day and actually walk away with less money than you had when you showed up. Um, which is, is a bit stressful. Um, there are a few other jobs like that, like day trading or something like that. But most jobs, when you show up, you're going to walk away with more money than, than you walked in with. That's not true for professional poker. Um, and so it's a really, interesting, a really interesting world. And I was really kind of growing into it uh, when something interesting happened, which was in, in 2009, the financial crisis, the housing bubble uh, bursting really changed the market for professional poker. Um, there was, before that time, there was kind of a lot of disposable income. Um, and poker really thrive, professional poker really thrives on uh, disposable income from people who know that they're probably not winning poker players, know that they're probably not gonna beat the Sharks, but have enough disposable income to come in and uh, have fun and, and play a few cards. Um, and that really dried up in 2009. So that left me wondering, kind of pondering my next move. Um, and Tina mentioned before that one of, the, one of the things about me is that I'm always doing multiple things. And so I didn't want to end up like this guy, the pro <laughs> poker player who's uh, begging, for, begging for change on the corner. So I knew I didn't want to end up that, that person, and so I really contemplated that next move. Luckily, I had that kind of uh, that, that desire to always be doing multiple things. So when I moved out to Las Vegas, I actually applied to grad school uh, at UNLV for computer science and kind of continued my education and continued to better myself in that way. And so uh, when this all happened, I, I said, well, what am I going to do next? I kind of looked around. I had connections from grad school. And I ended up applying at 
uh, a Las Vegas company called Zappos, um, which is an online shoe company uh, based in Las Vegas, known for customer service, uh, known for an amazing company culture. And a lot of the people that I went to grad school with were working at Zappos. And it just seemed like a really great opportunity, a really great fit. And so in 2009, I started at Zappos. Um, and as Tina mentioned, I started as a software developer. That was my background, um, my background there. Um, but it was really that diversification of doing multiple things that allowed me to land on my feet. Sorry for the bad pun. Um, <laughs> Uh, that allowed me to land on my feet uh, at Zappos. Um, and it, it, it is a great company, and I've loved working there um, throughout the years. Um, and I was kind of progressing up the normal job ladder at Zappos. Uh, the, you know, I was a software developer. After a year or so, I moved up to software management and so forth. Um, when uh, an amazing opportunity presented itself to me, which was uh, our CEO, Tony Shea, put out, uh, put out a posting to the company uh, that he was looking for a advisor, a technical advisor, somebody to follow him on a day in and day out basis for a year. And I said, well, that's, that's an amazing opportunity. Um, and so I applied and was lucky enough to get it. Um, and so, and that might not seem like a big risk uh, to, to you guys because obviously taking a position uh, with the CEO is, is, is a big opportunity, but it was also a risk because I was stepping outside of what I knew. I was stepping outside of, uh, of the software development job ladder. Uh, this wasn't like some position that there was a big raise or anything like that. Um, but I just saw it as this big opportunity to, to discover and learn more, more new things, uh, which is something I've always wanted to do. And so um, around four years ago, I took that, uh, took that position and it was amazing. There was a lot going on. Uh, we were moving to downtown Las Vegas from kind of the suburbs, uh, working on a big revitalization effort in downtown Las Vegas. Um, and also at that time, we were really starting to do a lot of thinking about Zappos and where we were as a company. We had grown from a small startup to a company of 1,500 people. Um, and really, there was a sense that we had grown into a different company than what we were when we were much smaller. We always had our core values at our, at our core, um, but we had, we had kind of grown to a space where when we were a startup, we were able to change course quickly and adjust. But as we had grown to 1,500 people, we found these changes that used to be able to happen overnight really just were hard to do. Um, and so we took a step back and we're thinking about how can we, how, how can we change our company to be able to be more adaptive, more innovative, um, and ultimately more prosperous? And so uh, Tony is really kind of a, a systems thinker and likes to think about systems. And he came across some, some interesting research. Um, the first thing is that uh, kind of the disengagement that exists today in the workplace. So, only 30% of employees today are engaged, meaning they care about the work, they care about the, the workplace uh, that they're in. 50% of employees are disengaged, and 20% are actively, actually actively disengaged, meaning they actually kind of work against the purpose of the organization. And so it's an epidemic today, in employee engagement. So that's one thing that we wanted to solve. The other thing uh, that, that was really interesting was how often companies fail. So we've heard about this over and over, but companies fail all the time. Of S&P 500 companies from 60 years ago, only 10 of them are still on that list today. 10%, I'm sorry, 10% are still on that list today. So the actual natural course of companies is death, okay? Um, and we don't want to die as a company. We want to survive and thrive. And so we started thinking about how can we become more resilient? So we looked for models for that. And the model that was really, uh, really got our attention uh, was the model of the city. Cities are amazing, resilient things. We're actually at a tipping point in society today where more people are living in cities than are living in, in rural areas. And that's the first time that that's ever happened in human civilization. Um, and so we, we started researching cities, and there was some interesting research that shows from Triumph of the City, uh, a book by Ed Glazier, that shows that 
Um, every time the size of a city doubles, productivity per resident goes up by 15%. But actually, the exact opposite thing happens as companies grow in size. So every time the size of a company doubles in size, productivity actually goes down on a per employee basis. And I think we've seen this, right? If you're in a company and you're in a big company, you've probably seen sometimes it's hard to get things done. Um, and so, but that really got us thinking, how can we structure our company more like a city is structured and less like a traditional company is structured? So we started taking a look at that and, and we thought about the model that we were running on, which was a standard kind of traditional hierarchical model. Um, and here's an example of uh, the tabulating machine company, <laughs> an old company. But this is exactly how our companies are run today. And the technology that our companies are run on today is over 100 years old. If you looked at companies from 100 years ago, they essentially look very similar to the companies of today. Um, and, and so we thought there's got to be something better. There's got to be something that allows our employees to be more engaged, that allows us to be more innovative as a company so that we can thrive. And that's really when we started to think about holacracy, which is the model that Tina talked about. Holacracy is a system of what's called self-organization. Uh, it's, a, it's a system where um, the company can evolve over time. Um, but also, one of the things that we really liked about holacracy as a system was that it allowed people to uh, explore their passions, to work on multiple different things, to be kind of more like an entrepreneur within the company rather than being a single spot in an organizational chart. And so we really liked this idea. The more that we learned about it, we really thought this is, this is something that could work for us. Um, and so in 2009, we, uh, or sorry, uh, 2012, we started, uh, no, 2014. Uh, we started rolling out uh, Holacracy at Zappos. Um, and it, it took us a little over a year to get the entire system rolled out. But I wanted to kind of talk to you about how, uh, how it looks like. And so this is my friend, Will Young, uh, in, in kind of a traditional sense, like his LinkedIn profile uh, says, director of Zappos Labs. So in a traditional organization, he would be somewhere in the organization on that org chart um, and his title would be director of Zappos Labs, and he would have you know, 15 people under him working on the, the purpose of Zappos Labs. In Holacracy, it looks a lot different. You're enabled to work on multiple different efforts all at the same time within in an organization. So on the right is the roles filled by Will. Um, and as you can see, there's actually a lot. So he's got maybe, call it 10 different roles. Um, and those roles are very unique and very different. So everything from um, helping, uh, helping people to reinvent themselves to thinking about how we can be a more efficient uh, workplace or some things that he's currently taking on, um, as well as a lot of the things that he used to do in that Zappos Labs, uh, that Zappos Labs work. So this is really what it looks like to be an employee in Holacracy, where you're able to work on different things. And this really fit with who I was as a person, right? I always wanted to be doing different things. I always wanted to be trying different things and figuring out the next big thing for me. And so um, how I kind of pictured this is in the outside world, I was able to diversify what I was doing. Um, and that allowed me to be resilient in my own personal life. This is kind of bringing that concept into companies where each person uh, can be self-organized, can be directed themselves. Um, and really what it leads to is less of a job ladder and more of a job jungle gym, where you're enabled to kind of find that next opportunity, find the thing that really aligns with what you're interested in, the skills that you have, or the skills that you want to pick up. And it allows our company to be more innovative and try more new things. Um, and so, uh, so this is a model that you know, I think is really interesting and I think actually has a lot of potential to really shake up the way that the work, the work is done today. Um, we've been doing this for about two and a half, three years. So we're still kind of in the early stages, the learning journey. We're the largest company to switch from a traditional model to Holacracy. 
Um, and so we're kind of going through the growing pains that, that come with that. We're developing the systems that are needed to actually run a 1,500 person company using this system. Um, so it's a scary and also exciting time at Zappos. Um, but I'll, I'll end with this, and holacracy is probably too complex for me to describe here in this, in this talk. Um, but I'll end with this. The, the, the point, oh, and, and by the way, uh, you can, these are some of the systems that I was talking about where you can, we have an internal role marketplace where you can look and find uh, roles that are really interesting and really, uh, really help push the company forward and align with your, your passions. But I'll end with this. Um, I think, you know, when you're thinking about risk, the conclusion that I've come to is that it's actually risky to not be risky. It's risky to not be risky. It's important, it's imperative, whether it's for yourself or within a company that you work for, to think about what are the things that you can take on to diversify yourself, to diversify your life, to diversify the purpose and the passions of whatever it is that you're doing so that when things change, because things will inevitably change, there's no way to avoid change. It happened to me in my life in poker. Um, it will happen to any company over time. Things inevitably change. And if you're not prepared for that change, if you don't have multiple things going on, if you're not diversified, you will inevitably fail. So it's incumbent on all of us to look for what can we do different, what can we do to learn and grow and diversify ourselves into multiple different areas. So I would put that out as a, as a charge to all of you guys to think about what can I take on that will allow me to find the next big thing, whatever that may be. Um, and so, uh, by the way, um, when I shifted from uh, poker to Zappos, it wasn't like a whole shift. I continued, you know, it's not like when you take on a job, you can't continue to do the thing that you, you were doing before. Um, and so I continued to play poker. Um, and actually last year, actually right before I met Tina, um, I had the biggest win of my life, uh, which was a, a televised uh, poker final table. Um, and, uh, and it was the biggest win of my life. And it just shows how through diversification, through working on multiple different things, um, you can continue to prosper and continue to be uh, successful. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.